Thank you for joining us on this inaugural student loan webinar. So I'm here with Mark Kantrowitz. My name is Julian Duran. I work at Saving for College. Uh, Mark here though is the expert and just to go a little into who Mark is, and I mean, he'll talk uh, more about this, uh, but Mark is basically the top expert when it comes to student loans. So for everyone joining, I'm sure you guys have questions on how the CARES Act and you know, all these government relief efforts are affecting um, your student loans, your student loan payments. Um, some of you are wondering about financial aid appeals. Uh, Mark is the go-to person when it comes to this. You know, he's testified in front of Congress, in front of many state agencies, um, has been quoted in more than 10,000 newspaper and magazine articles. You know, I could go on with the list of accolades, but um, probably best for you guys to hear from the expert himself. So um, without further ado, Mark, uh, thank you for joining us here and um, let's get started. Thank you, Julian. So today we're talking about the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on uh, saving and paying for college, and I'll get right started. Uh, so the most famous aspect of the CARES Act, the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act, uh, is the payment pause and interest waiver on student loans. The law pauses the payments on certain federal student loans, not all of them, through September 30th of the year 2020, and it is retroactive to March 13, the date the president announced that there would be a payment pause and interest waiver. Uh, the, um, the interest waiver and the payment pause are automatic. You do not need to apply for them. And uh, it's only the loans that are paused that get an interest waiver. But you can have a paused loan and make payments on that loan and still have that interest waiver. Um, and in order to be eligible for these loans, uh, for the payment pause, the loans have to be held by the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, and that includes both federal student loans as well as federal parent loans. Even though we often refer to loans as student loans, which might be interpreted as restricting just to students as opposed to parents, um, that's just a generic term and uh, it refers to parent loans as well. And for borrowers who are pursuing loan forgiveness, such as public service loan forgiveness, and the 20 or 25 year forgiveness at the end of an income driven repayment plan, the good news is that these non-payment payments, the pause payments, are going to count as though you were making payments for the purpose of the loan forgiveness programs. So from March 13 to September 30th is almost six months. I mean, it, it'll count as though you had made six monthly payments even though you weren't making any payments. It also counts towards rehabilitation of defaulted federal student loans. Um, there are three different types of rehabilitation. Uh, there, you can consolidate after three months. You can uh, regain eligibility for federal student aid after six months. And the default gets cleared from your credit history um, after if you make nine out of 10 consecutive full, voluntary, reasonable, and affordable monthly payments. So six months being counted towards that means that um, potentially you'd only have to make three additional payments to rehabilitate a defaulted student loan. Now, I said before that only federal loans that are held by the U.S. Department of Education are eligible for the payment pause and interest waiver. This includes all loans in the direct loan program, including the direct Stafford loan, the Grad Plus loan, the Parent Plus loan, and federal direct consolidation loans. Now, there are certain loans in the old guaranteed student loan program that's also known as FELP, or the Federal Family Education Loan Program, that are eligible because they are held by the U.S. Department of Education. This includes loans that were made in 2008-09 and 2009-10 that were transferred from a FELP lender to the U.S. Department of Education under the ECASA legislation, the Ensuring Continued Access to Student Loans Act of 2008. So even though those are FELP loans, they are held by the U.S. Department of Education. Also, when a borrower in FELP defaults on their loan, that loan is transferred to the U.S. Department of Education. Title to the loan is transferred through a state guarantee agency when that guarantee agency pays the default claim on the loan. 
Um, now, if that loan has been rehabilitated, it may have been sold back to a felt lender. But until that occurs, or if you're still in default on that loan, um, it is eligible for the payment pause and interest waiver, which means that interest won't be continuing to accrue on that defaulted loan. And so overall, about seven out of eight federal student loans in general are eligible. But what loans are not eligible? If it's not owned by the U.S. Department of Education, it isn't eligible. So that includes FELP loans that are still held by commercial lenders like banks, credit unions, some state lenders, uh, and other non-bank financial institutions. Those are not eligible for the payment pause and interest waiver. Uh, private student loans and private parent loans are not eligible. And also the federal Perkins loan is not eligible unless it's held by the U.S. Department of Education, and most of those are still held by colleges and universities, because when they transfer those loans, they assign them to the U.S. Department of Education, they lose their share of the revolving loan fund, which the schools want to get back. Now, can you change a ineligible loan into an eligible loan? If you have a FELP loan that's held by a commercial lender or a federal Perkins loan, you can consolidate them into a federal direct consolidation loan, which can take 30 to 45 days. But once they are consolidated, they become eligible for the payment pause and interest waiver. There are, however, some potential drawbacks of moving these loans into the direct loan program. Um, the if the FELP lender was providing you with a prompt payment discount or an interest rate reduction, uh, you will lose those because those are provided by the lender and not the loan program. Uh, if you have any accrued but unpaid interest, maybe you've been in a deferment or forbearance, or maybe you've been in default, well, that would have been transferred, but in any of these non-paying statuses, I'm not yet in default, playing maybe 200 days delinquent, that interest will be capitalized, will be added to the loan balance when you consolidate that loan. In addition, there is some controversy over whether this resets the clock on 25-year forgiveness under the income-based repayment plan, which is available in the FELL program. The statutory language says that it doesn't reset, but the regulations kind of hint that it does reset. And the U.S. Department of Education on its website says that it resets. Um, the regulations are narrower than the statutory language, so it may reset. Uh, and then finally, the federal Perkins loans lose certain of their benefits if you consolidate them into a direct loan, a consolidation loan. In particular, the, these are federal Perkins loans are subsidized loans, so during a deferment, the interest gets um, suspended. Well, and you, you still get a payment pause and interest waiver. It's just that after this is all over, you will have lost that benefit if you decide to go back to school or need some kind of a deferment. Uh, and they have a large laundry list of loan forgiveness options that you lose when you consolidate. You gain public service loan forgiveness, but you lose all the specialized loan forgiveness programs that are available for federal Perkins loans. Private student loans and private parent loans cannot be converted into eligible loans because you can't consolidate them into the direct loan program. Now, if you have ineligible loans and you don't want to consolidate them if they're FELP or they're private loans and so you can't consolidate them into the direct loan program, there are a variety of other options for financial relief. Uh, for FELP loans, there is the economic hardship deferment which you can qualify for if you are receiving certain uh, government benefit programs like TANF, Supplemental Security Income, SNAP, which used to be food stamps, State General Public Assistance. If you're a Peace Corps volunteer, if you're working full-time, at least 30 hours a week, but you're earning no more than the federal minimum wage, which is currently $7.25 an hour, uh, or if your income is less than or equal to 150% of the poverty line, you can qualify for the economic hardship deferment. So if you've lost your job, that uh, and you will certainly qualify for that. There's also an unemployment deferment. Um, 
and these there are also forbearances which don't have the benefit of suspending the interest on subsidized loans, both with a deferment, the government pays the interest on a subsidized loan for the duration of the deferment, the borrower is responsible for the interest on unsubsidized loans. Under forbearance, the borrower is responsible for all the interest. But you can defer the interest by capitalizing it at the end of the uh, deferment or forbearance period. Uh, in the federal loans, uh, deferments and forbearances are valid for up to three years in total duration. Um, and um, in addition to deferments and forbearances, there are four income-driven repayment plans. There's uh, just one in the FEL program, the income-based repayment. There are four in uh, the direct loan program. Um, and in the FEL program, income-based repayment will have a zero monthly payment if your income is less than 150% of the poverty line. So if you lost your job and your income is zero, you can get a zero monthly payment that way. Interest will still accrue, but at least your payment obligation will be suspended. Um, and if you're already in an income-driven repayment plan, income-based repayment in FELP, you can always ask your loan servicer to recertify your income if your income has changed. Maybe you uh, are experiencing a job loss or a furlough or a salary reduction. You can ask the loan service to, servicer to adjust for that. Uh, private student loans don't have as many options. They basically have forbearances, um, and those forbearances are limited to a year in total duration, usually in two to three month increments that you then have to renew. Uh, but there's also something called a partial forbearance, which consists of suspending the repayment obligation except for the interest. So it's interest only payments. The benefit of this is that since there will be no interest accruing that is unpaid because you'll be paying it, your loan balance won't be getting larger, but you then have to pay the interest, which can be um, typically uh, anywhere up to half of the monthly payment. Um, the further you are into the loan, the less it is. Now, the Federal Reserve has slashed interest rates close to zero um, on the federal funds rate, and so the question's arises, well, are the interest rates on student loans going to drop? Now, the interest rates on federal loans are adjusted once a year on July 1st, um, and these loans, and federal loans currently have fixed interest rates, uh, and so this will apply to new loans that are made on or after July 1st. It's based on the last 10-year Treasury note auction in May, uh, which we haven't yet reached, but we can look at the Treasury note auction that was in April, and that suggests that the interest rates on new federal loans uh, starting in July 1st will drop by somewhere between one and a half and two percentage points. They will reach a new record low. Um, but unfortunately, you can't take your existing federal loans and somehow refinance them into new federal loans uh, in order to um, take advantage of the uh, new interest rates. You could refinance them into private loans, but then you lose all of the superior benefits that are associated with federal loans, including the payment pause and interest waiver. Now, with regard to private student loans, they tend to be pegged to the LIBOR index, a few to the prime lending rate or other index rates. Um, and the ones that are pegged to the LIBOR index are pegged to either the one-month or the three-month LIBOR index. And what that is is an average of the LIBOR index over the last month, um, or in the case of the three-month LIBOR, over the last three months. So it can take as much as three months for the private student loans to reflect the new interest rates. Now, if you have a variable rate loan, you won't need to do anything. It's going to... Uh, automatically get that new interest rate when it fully phases in. Uh, if you have a fixed rate, it's not going to change, but you could potentially refinance that private student loan into a new private student loan. Fixed rate, obviously, is the desirable one when interest rates are at historic lows, and use that to um, take advantage of these new lower rates. Now, I said that 
um, when you refinance federal loans into private loans, you lose the superior benefits of the federal loans. So what are these benefits? Uh, clearly, right now, we have a payment pause and interest waiver. Uh, some private student loan lenders are providing a special forbearance of 60 or 90 days, um, but interest continues to accrue on that, so it's not quite the equivalent of what you can get on the federal loans. And as I mentioned before, you have economic hardship deferment, the unemployment deferment, and longer forbearances, and the deferments and forbearances on the federal loans are up to three years each. So that three years for economic hardship, three years for unemployment, and three years for forbearances, a total of potentially nine years. Hopefully we don't need to use that. Uh, and on the private loans, it's a year in total duration. Um, federal loans offer death and disability discharges. Only about half of private loans offer a death discharge, and fewer offer a disability discharge. Uh, federal loans offer income-driven repayment plans. Almost all private loans don't offer that. There, there's one loan in Rhode Island that has a version of income-based repayment. And federal loans have, income, have uh, loan forgiveness options, which private loans generally do not. Though you might be able to get uh, student loan repayment assistance from your employer if your employer is one of the 8% of employers that provide that, and they pro generally provide that both to federal and private student loans. So. What other types of financial relief are available for federal loans? Uh, first of all, if you have a defaulted federal student loan or defaulted federal parent loan, um, your, the collection activity should have completely ceased if it's a government-held loan. Remember the distinction between direct loans and FELP loans and the FELP loans that are held by the U.S. Department of Education. It's only the government-held ones that this uh, guidance applies to. Some of the private felt lenders have done the same, but they aren't necessarily required to do so. Um, and collection efforts include the administrative wage garnishment, where they take up to 15% of your paycheck to repay your student loan, uh, the treasury offset program, where they intercept your federal income tax refund and uh, your social security disability and retirement benefits, 15% of that. Um, now, you may have um, had some of this occur anyway after March 13 because your employer may not have heard that they were supposed to stop the wage garnishment uh, or um, there, there may have been some lagging um, in terms of when the um, income tax refunds were seized. Uh, if it was seized after Mar on or after March 13, you can get a refund of that uh, upon request uh, if you need that money back. Um, in addition uh, to the end of the suspension of the collection efforts, um, the law, the CARES Act, added tax-free status for employer-paid student loan repayment assistance programs. Uh, and that runs from the date of enactment, which is March 27, through the end of 2020. And that can be up to a total of $5,250. Most uh, employers give less, typically $100 a month. Um, and only about 8% of employers provide this currently, according to the Society for Human Resource Management, otherwise known as SHRM. But the belief is that this may cause more employers to decide to offer this because some of them were just waiting for tax-free status. And as many as a quarter of employers said, as soon as it gets tax-free status, they'll consider uh, adding that benefit. So maybe a total of a third of employers will ha be doing this by the end of the year. and remains to be seen. Um, and in addition, if you were... Um, I mean, pursue, if you were conducting your teaching activities in fulfillment of your TEACH grant obligation or you were pursuing teacher loan forgiveness, obviously the K-12 schools are closed in most of the country. Um, you're going to be made whole in that your full-time teaching service, if it otherwise would have qualified, uh, is still going to count towards a TEACH grant and teacher loan forgiveness, even if it was switched to part-time or it's incomplete because of the pandemic. Now, the recovery rebate 
uh, are these checks from the federal government to individuals uh, for twelve hundred dollars per person if you're single married filing jointly it's two people times twelve hundred is twenty four hundred plus five hundred dollars per qualifying child you have to be a u.s citizen or permanent resident you cannot be a non-resident alien so someone from overseas uh, and also undocumented individuals are not eligible and you have to have a work eligible social security number that's kind of the way they're confirming it unfortunately college students are caught in a kind of catch-22 situation. They can't qualify, many of them, for the recovery rebate on their own, and their parents can't claim them as a qualifying child to get the lesser $500 amount. The college students who are under age 24 can be claimed as a dependent on their parents' federal income tax return. Because they are claimable, not whether they're claimed, but whether they are claimable, they are ineligible for the $1,200. There are a few exceptions. If a college student is married and files a joint return with their spouse, they, um, they can qualify for the $1,200 for them and $1,200 for their spouse. Um, if they provide more than half of their own support, um, financial support, then they can potentially um, not be claimable as a dependent. And if they are, do not live in the home for more than half the year, um, but that doesn't count time that they were away in school. Temporary absences for education count as though they were still living in the home. But if they've been living on their own and no longer living with their family um, as an independent student, that maybe they can qualify for this. But more than half of all college students aren't going to qualify for the recovery rebate. And the qualifying child definition requires a child to be under age 17. Well, only 0.1% of college students are age 16 and younger. So they won't be able to claim that. So they're kind of caught in the middle. If you are in a non-traditional student, so over age, age 24 or older, you are gonna qualify. Or if you've graduated and are no longer a student, you are going to potentially qualify. Uh, and common question is, if a borrower is in default on the federal student loans, will they still receive the recovery rebate? And the answer to that is yes. There was an explicit exception to Treasury offset for the recovery rebate. So the federal government will not offset the recovery rebate. They will not, if you work for the federal government, they're not going to reduce um, your refund because of um, the, re the recovery rebate is technically a refund. Um, so you will um, still get that recovery rebate because the intention is to help people who are struggling. And by definition, so a borrower who's in default is struggling financially. And people also wonder, is this recovery rebate taxable? Uh, it is not because it is technically a refund of a 2020 tax credit. It's an early refund. And refunds aren't taxable. They aren't income to you. And they also will not affect your uh, students' eligibility for financial aid this year or in later years. Um, now, how do you get the recovery rebate? As I said, it's an advanced refund of the 2020 tax credit that was added by the CARES Act. Um, they are estimating it because nobody's filed their 2020 tax returns. They, some people are have filed or will file their 2019 tax returns. So if you file the 2019 tax return, they're going to estimate your eligibility based on your 2019 federal income tax return. If you haven't filed your 2019 tax return, they're going to base it on your 2018 federal income tax return. So you should check your income. If your income in 2018 is lower, then maybe you delay filing your 2019 tax return so that you can qualify for a larger um, I mean, one of these recovery rebates. I mean, there are income phase outs. Um, I mean, single up to 75,000 is where um, the income phase out starts and it gets reduced by 5% for every dollar, 5% uh, of every dollar beyond that. Double that for married filing jointly, uh, 112500 for head of household. Um, and 
but if your 2019 income is lower, then you want to hurry up and file that 2019 federal income tax return. Um, even if you, you should file, even if you don't have a tax liability, just to make sure that the IRS has your mailing address, if they're going to send you a check, or your direct deposit information, if you want a direct deposit, which is faster than mailing you a check. Um, now, if you've already filed your 2019 tax return and you've moved, or you're not filing your 2019 tax return yet because you have until July 15 this year to do that instead of April 15, um, and so their, your address on your 2018 tax return is old, uh, you can file IRS Form 8822 to change your address with the IRS. But there's also this IRS Get Payment Tool, uh, Get My Payment Tool, um, and I give the URL here. It's irs.gov slash coronavirus slash get my payment with hyphens. Uh, you can use that to check on whether you're eligible uh, and if they determine that you are, and for many taxpayers, they aren't able to determine that, um, you then uh, you can potentially give your direct deposit information there. Now, the CARES Act includes a whole variety of other financial relief for college students, and U.S. Department of Education guidance also covers some of these issues. First thing is that if the student's receiving federal work-study funds, and they can't work their job because the college campus closed, which many of them have, or because their employer, if they were in an off-campus employer, closed. They will still be paid their federal work-study wages, and while the colleges can, are allowed to. They aren't required to, but most will. Um, and it's the work-study wages um, can be paid either in a lump sum or in installments, um, and it's through the end of this academic year, so through June 30th, uh, and um, the, they're being paid the scheduled award, not an average based on the previous hours worked. So if you were eligible for a certain total dollar amount, that's the amount that you'll get minus amounts that you've already been paid, as opposed to if you only worked one hour a week uh, instead of 10 hours, you're going to be paid based on the 10 hours, not the one hour. Um, if you're an AmeriCorps volunteer, um, you can receive an education award, but if your service was interrupted by the coronavirus, you will still get your full education award. Um, they're making you whole, because um, it wasn't your fault that you couldn't work the volunteer job. Um, if your enrollment status changed because classes were canceled, because not every class can be moved online. I, dance and art um, classes, those are really difficult to move online. Um, they will not affect your financial aid for the current academic term because as of the census date, which is the, also called the ad drop date, that's when the college determined your eligibility and guidance from the U.S. Department of Education says you don't have to reevaluate for subsequent changes in enrollment status. So the colleges aren't going to do that. Let the student get their full federal financial aid. Now, because the colleges kick the students out of the dormitories, uh, and also they I mean, parking fees and canceled classes as opposed to online classes, some of the colleges are providing prorated refunds for room and board. It's about 70% are giving cash refunds, 20% are giving a credit or a voucher for a future semester, and the remainder are either saying no or they're waiting and seeing before they decide. And even th some of those that are providing cash refunds say, well, it'll be at the end of the academic term, um, not right now, even though the students needed money three weeks ago. Um, the, unfortunately, if they do it as a credit or voucher for future, uh, it's counted as what's called estimated financial assistance or EFA, and that will reduce aid eligibility. But if they uh, give it as cash right now, this term, it will not reduce your aid eligibility. So it is better for the student if the college gives a refund in cash than says, oh, you, we'll, we'll give you a credit for a future semester. Um, if the student actually has to withdraw from college as opposed to just moving to the online education, um, they are not going to be required to repay their federal student loans or the Pell Grant or SEOG grant for the current semester. 
Uh, that was something U.S. Department of Education decided to to do. Um, there were there was going to be problems with study abroad programs and international students studying in the U.S. because study abroad programs are not allowed to provide the education through distance learning or online education. And international students on an M visa cannot participate in online education. And on an F visa, they can do only one class a semester online. While the rules have been waived, they can receive their, all of their classes through online education. Um, there was a special law passed uh, to, to do that. That law also addressed the, um, the GI Bill benefits, which had similar restrictions that a college actually has to be approved to provide um, online education to students receiving GI Bill benefits, and there wasn't enough time to uh, accommodate that, so the special law was passed to enable that. And there's also a couple of lawsuits going on against colleges that aren't giving cash refunds because you really you can't charge for something that you aren't providing. Now, there's um, if you're affected by the pandemic, maybe you lost your job or your parents lost your, their jobs, uh, or uh, you, you had a salary reduction, or you can't work the full hours because you're quarantined or in a shelter in place order, or maybe you're hospitalized, um, or you have extra expenses, like when the colleges moved everything online, maybe you didn't have a computer, so you have to go out and buy one. Uh, or you're back home where you don't have internet access, so you have to arrange for that. That adds to your costs. Uh, plus, I mean, the students had to return home um, in a hurry, so they, um, and they may have cost some extra money. And their belongings, they may have had to store them or ship them home. Uh, so if you're affected by special circumstances, the U.S. Department of Education has issued guidance to the colleges saying that Students can appeal based on these special circumstances that are due to the pandemic, uh, that it is an allowable. Now, the process of an appeal hasn't changed. Um, you just can appeal for more aid. That doesn't mean the college is going to grant the appeal, uh, but I mean, they might. Uh, and in addition to the ability to appeal for more financial aid, um, the colleges can waive part of the, their satisfactory academic progress policy. Satisfactory academic progress requires the student to have be making uh, quantitative progress to uh, achieving a degree and maintain qualitative performance at least a 2.0 GPA. The Department of Education said that if a student attempted a credit but it wasn't completed because of the pandemic, it can be excluded and ignored with regard to satisfactory academic progress. And colleges are generally, I mean, some of them are switching to pass, no credit or pass, fail. So if you get a passing grade, it'll probably count as though you're satisfying the satisfactory academic progress. Um, now, when, when you appeal to a college, um, ask the college financial aid office uh, what their process is. Some of them will have a form that you download from their website. Some of them will just say, write us a letter that where you summarize your special circumstances and what the financial impact of those circumstances were on your family's ability to pay for college. Now, the CARES Act also established two, not one, two emergency financial aid grants. One is based on the Federal Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant, otherwise known as CEOG, and the other is based on the Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund, which has a HERF acronym. And the emergency financial aid grants will not affect eligibility for other financial aid. It is not considered estimated financial assistance, so it doesn't reduce aid eligibility. So the first of these is smaller. Um, it allows colleges to transfer any unused federal work study funding to the CR grant. Um, in addition, they may have leftover CR grants, and they can use those funds to provide emergency financial aid. Uh, there are some restrictions. They can't give you more in this emergency aid than the maximum federal Pell Grant, which is $6,195 in 2019-20, 
and six thousand three hundred forty-five dollars in twenty twenty twenty-one. Um, and there are, though, it's a little bit more flexible in what they can award it for. It's for, in the law, it says unexpected expenses and unmet financial need as a result of a qualifying emergency. So, the parent lost a job and their ability to pay is reduced. The college can use this money to provide more aid to the student. Now, the HERE, Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund, um, is money that was provided by Congress, a total of $14 billion to colleges based on their enrollment of um, undergraduate and graduate students, um, a little bit more tilted towards uh, Pell Grant recipients and non-recipients, but that does require them to provide it only to Pell Grant recipients. It's a total of $14 billion. At least half of that money, $7 billion, must be used for emergency financial aid grants. And those grants have to be provided directly to the student. They, um, the college can't simply apply it to the student's balance with the college if the student owes money. It, they actually have to give the money to the student. The student can choose to pay their balance with the college, or the student can use it for other purposes related to the emergency. Um, the intention of this is anything that was related to the disruption of campus operations due to coronavirus. So the student needed a computer uh, to um, go online, this could potentially be used for that. Um, and the law says it can also include anything that is an eligible expense under the college's cost of attendance, and they gave examples, food, housing, course materials, technology, healthcare, and childcare. Uh, each college is approaching this differently. They have a broad discretion in how they dole out the money. Some are just giving a flat amount to every student. The average amount per student uh, nationwide is about $300. Some colleges have more, some colleges have less. Um, the colleges argue that it's much simpler. They just get the, and they can get the money to the students quicker. Others are saying, well, we need to assess and who has a greater need so that we can meet those needs. So they are, they have a application form that the student has to fill out, relatively simple one. Do you need money? What for? Um, and then the colleges, some colleges are doing a mix, a hybrid approach. Now the impact on 529 college savings plans, um, well, first of all, if you're in an age-based asset allocation, and the child is about to go to college or already in college, uh, the percentage that is in stocks and mutual funds of stocks and similar equities is going to be relatively low. I and mean, most of these age-based asset allocations bottom out at 10% equities, which means the stock market went down as much as 35%. 10% of that is 3.5%. And most of your investment would have been bonds and the price on bonds went up so that partially compensates for the stock losses. Um, now if your child is much younger, yes, you will have a much more severe reduction in your 529 plan, but you have time to recover from the losses and you probably don't have as much money invested. Um, you should stay invested. And we saw this in 2008, some families panicked when the stock market went down uh, almost 40% in 2008. Between June 2008 and February 2009, it went down 60%. People panicked at that and they just pulled it all out. Well, then they missed out on the economic recovery, which started in March. Um, and in the next two years, it doubled the value of investments. So you don't want to try timing the market. Just stay in, what goes down comes up, hopefully. Um, and if anything, you should increase your contributions if you're able to, because you can think of this as a buying opportunity. Stock prices are really, really low right now compared to where they were uh, just a few months ago. And when we see a recovery, um, it will yield very large returns on that investment if you buy, when, buy low, sell high. Now, if you get a refund of room and board charges from the college, and that refund was you, in, that those costs were money that you originally paid with 529 plan money, you may have to return that money, recontribute it to the 529 plan. You can do so within 60 days and thereby avoid any 
uh, taxes and tax penalty on the suddenly non-qualified distribution because the qualified expenses disappeared. Now, if you have a mix that, let's say you, um, you use 529 plan money to pay for half of the room and board and your own money to pay for the other half, you don't necessarily have to um, return the money to the 529 plan if the amount you paid is ex equals or exceeds the amount of the refund. So you have to do the math to f make sure that the 529 plan um, has enough qualified expenses to justify the qualified distribution in full. I mean, maybe uh, you had substantial tuition, fees, and room and board that you were paying yourself. Well, you, that can help you qualify, um, have those uh, distribution be fully qualified. In addition, you might have new expenses that you can uh, use the 529 plan to justify the distribution from the 529 plan. For example, a qualified expense for a 529 plan includes the cost of a computer, peripheral software, and internet access, as well as other equipment that are required for enrollment or attendance. Uh, so anything required to participate in online education. Or maybe you need a computer chair or a desk. And that may be a little bit out there, but I think you could probably get away with it. Uh, so you either have to recontribute the money or justify the money with other qualified expenses or show that to yourself that um, you didn't actually use 529 plan money to pay for the, re the amount that was refunded. Now, I've worked from home for 15 out of the last 20 years, so I have a lot of experience uh, with working from home. The only thing that's different from my perspective is my kids are home from school. So a lot of this is going to seem like it's obvious, and things are obvious in 2020 hindsight, but sometimes people, and it takes them a while to learn these tips. So I'm going to give a few tips about working from home. I mean, first of all, don't become a hermit, because based on the current statistics, either someone you know or someone they know is or will be infected with the coronavirus. So you may, they may be your friend, they may be your family member, an aunt, an uncle, grandparent, but they might have the coronavirus and not yet know it. Because before someone becomes symptomatic, the coronavirus can be transmitted. Some people never de demonstrate symptoms, yet they have it and they can transmit it. That's why this spreads so quickly. Uh, so just because someone looks healthy doesn't mean that they aren't infected and can't transmit it to you. So become a hermit. That's what I told to my parents who are in their 80s. Now, when you're home, you want to have a dedicated room where you're working, where you're not going to get interrupted. So a room with a door as opposed to the kitchen table. I mean, if, you, all, if the kitchen table is all you have, then you use it. But ideally, set aside a room that's quiet for work. Uh, I used to work out of a room which didn't have a door. And any time I was on the phones or giving a webinar, my cats would come in and start meowing because I was talking. There was no one there. I must be talking to them. Um, it's also important to set a routine. You want to get up at the same time each day. Uh, you want to do what you normally do. You shower, you get dressed, you eat breakfast, and have specific hours for your work. Because otherwise, you're going to be tempted to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because work is just a few footsteps away. So by setting specific hours, you maintain some work-life balance. And you, you could have like a break in the middle of the day for an hour when you play with your kids or your pets, um, or maybe you're teaching them, so you, you do some teaching at that point. But it, have a routine. It's going to make you feel a lot more comfortable. Um, also, schedule breaks throughout the day. I and mean, you may get sit at your computer and be typing all day while well, you're going to need to get up and stretch from time to time. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have eye strain and you're going to get a stiff neck and other issues. So and don't sit for the entire work day. And uh, one thing that I found is that typing on a laptop when you're typing for eight hours a day uh, can be I mean, hurt your hands, your wrists. 
So you want to get a full-size keyboard, maybe one that plugs into a USB port on the, uh, on the laptop or desktop, or maybe one that um, is wireless. Um, but it should be a full-size one so that you are, it feels better when you're typing on it. And you want to have an external mouse. And better yet, have, also have a monitor that is larger so that you're not going to suffer from eye strain. And you've always heard of the ergonomic advice that you need to have a good chair and you have the monitor at eye level. This is the time to start following that advice because otherwise you're going to be stretching your neck in a weird way. Better to have it at eye level. So I mean, if you're at a kitchen table or desk, I mean, elevate the laptop a little bit or have this external monitor higher up. Uh, when you're talking, communicating with people, it's important to keep the email messages short and to the point. Uh, send them only to the people who need to see it. Um, and have a specific call to action in the first paragraph. If you need someone to do something, put it right there up front, maybe even the first sentence, because otherwise they might not read the full message, and what you ask for might not get done. If you send it to too many people, you're going to get the bystander effect where everybody who receives it thinks someone else is going to take care of it. So, and that's something that it takes a year sometimes for people who are working from home or communicating exclusively by email to realize that they need to do. And you should also have occasional telephone conversations with people, um, Zoom conferences with people, even not just for work purposes, but to chat with them. Because that's something you get in work that you're not getting when you're isolated at home. Now, with video conferencing, uh, the software that I've used uh, has included Zoom, which we're using right now, Google Hangouts, WebEx, GoToMeeting, and Microsoft Teams. For webinars, I actually like GoToMeeting a lot because it has specialized tools that make it easier, though I wouldn't be surprised if Zoom starts adding a lot of these features soon. Um, another important thing is clean the lens on your webcam, because if it's dirty, other people are going to see it, and uh, you want, might not notice it. And better yet, take a picture with your webcam and not only check whether there's some um, blurriness or dirt on the lens, but also look at what people are seeing behind you. I mean, is, uh, does your backdrop look professional? I mean, Zoom and other software lets you put in a custom backdrop. Um, please don't do the uh, Hawaii uh, beach uh, view, um, it, everybody does that, and uh, when you see everybody doing it, it, it gets a little bit repetitive. Um, when you have a meeting via Zoom, try to limit the number of participants so you can actually see their faces instead of seeing a postage stamp. Um, you need to check the privacy settings on Zoom. The default settings weren't I mean, we're very loose from privacy point of view. So um, Zoom bombing would occur where a Zoombie, a new word, um, would break into your meeting and disrupt it by doing offensive things. Uh, some of the colleges have learned this uh, very quickly that they need to uh, deal with it because they, they would just guess a random meeting ID and then half the time they would get into a real meeting and then they would, um, with poor privacy settings, they were able to take over the meeting. And the most important thing is when you connect to video conferencing software, mute your microphone. Uh, if you need to unmute, most of the software will allow you to temporarily unmute by holding down your space bar. Now, uh, we have on savingforcollege.com a free student loan forgiveness tip sheet that if you sign up for our free student loan newsletter, you can receive this you know, for free. Um, and it's 529.savingforcollege.com slash student loan forgiveness. And we're putting out a lot of good content on student loans because not everybody saves for college or saves enough for college, so they need to rely on student loans. So there's kind of a balance there. Uh, every dollar you save is a dollar less you're going to have to borrow, but some people still need to borrow, so we're trying to serve that need. The U.S. Department of Education is posting information um, about K-12 and college at ed.gov slash coronavirus. Um, the higher education updates are linked to from there, and it's studentaid.gov slash announcements events 
slash coronavirus. And here's an example and what the loan forgiveness tip sheet looks like. It's a two page, um, twice as tall as this. Um, in addition to the student loan forgiveness tip sheet, uh, I wrote the book on how to appeal for college financial aid. And there is a free tip sheet on how to appeal on the book's website at cantorist.com slash book slash appeal. And the, the book's over 250 pages, so if you're doing an appeal, you might uh, want to get it or not. Um, but it, it teaches you, it's like a textbook on how to appeal for finance, more financial aid. And uh, this is what it looks like. Um, it's a one-pager, um, but you can get it for free just by clicking on a, a link on the book's web page. So now we're going to open up for questions. Um, obviously, this is produced by savingforcollege.com, so you can learn everything and anything about saving and paying for college on our website. If you have um, any questions that you think aren't covered by our website, chances are they are, but if, they, if you think they aren't, please feel free to send us an idea for an article that we can add to our website. We, we get some of our best ideas from our readers. Thank you so much, Mark. Really appreciate your time on this. And you know, just to underscore that last um, note for all of our participants, we have 36 questions outstanding. We're gonna to try to get to all of them, but um, for those that we do not, um, please do send us your ideas. Uh, we're very responsive when it comes to that. Um, okay, so moving on to the questions I have so far. Um, let's start with uh, this one. So we have somebody asking, um, okay, so I'll just say the question as is, what about the 23 year old who graduated in 2019, who was claimed as a dependent in 2019, but will not be able to be claimed as a dependent on the 2020 taxes? Will they still receive the rebate? Right, well, they are eligible for the rebate, but they might not receive it. Remember, the recovery rebate is an advance refund of a tax credit from your 2020 tax return. Because they're basing it on 2019 federal income taxes, the, that, tax, that 2019 tax return may indicate that you're not eligible. But since you are eligible, when you file your 2020 tax return, you are going to get that rebate. You're just not going to get it now. And there really isn't any easy way to um, get it right now, unfortunately. Okay. Um, we had uh, some people asking about grad loans. Uh, we have someone who asked, do grad students qualify for the HEERF? Yes. Um, the statutory language um, said students didn't qualify it as just undergraduate students. So graduate students are eligible for it. Um, it's up to the individual college how, how they allocate the money, whether it's just undergrad students or grad students. Um, I think most colleges will probably give some money to both, uh, especially if you have a need that is derived from the coronavirus. Um, I mean, most of the colleges that are telling students to vacate the dorms are not telling graduate students to, um, that are in married student housing to vacate the dorms if that's where they're living. But, and you might have a problem where you're living off campus in an apartment and you're no longer being paid and you need money to help pay your rent. So let the college financial aid office or your graduate department know about your issues. Probably both would be a get some redundancy in there to let them know that you need help and, and they'll do their best to try to help you. Keeping in mind that the colleges not only have to give refunds to their students, but they're looking at having significantly reduced uh, enrollments in the fall because international students who are new international students may not be able to get to the U.S. And domestic students may be staying closer to home, um, or they may even be um, taking a gap year. So some colleges are predicting 10 to 20% enrollment declines, which affects their tuition revenue, which affects their uh, ability to cover all these expenses. Uh, plus, in, in generally after an economic downturn, state tax revenue is down, they cut their budget, first place they cut is appropriations to state public colleges, uh, and the co those colleges have to re increase tuition uh, to make up for that difference, which is exactly the wrong point in time. 
only about 300, 400 colleges have endowments of any significance, but even those endowments are down significantly. Um, but the uh, purpose of an endowment is as a rainy day fund, and it's pouring. So colleges should do something. Uh, thank you, Mark. Just going back to the start of the presentation, we had someone who asked, regarding the CARES Act, I know that they are supposed to suspend interest on student loans. Does this apply to loans in deferment as well? Is this automatic or do we have to apply? Do you know where to apply? Okay. Um, deferments do qualify uh, and forbearances for that um, interest waiver. So it's not just loans that are um, in active repayment. And in fact, even loans that are in an in-school status or grace period status qualify for that interest waiver. So you will get that interest waiver and it is automatic. You don't need to do anything to get it. Awesome. Uh, changing topics here a little bit. How will the process for applying for private student loans be impacted? We are planning to start the process in June or the fall of 2020 semester. Should we adjust our timing or how we go about looking for slash comparing private loans? And so private student loans uh, for the most part are going to use the same process. Uh, there are some rumors that some private lenders are going to tighten their credit underwriting criteria. But when I've talked to the lenders, none of them have said that they're doing that. And that's probably because some mortgage lenders say that they're tightening their lending criteria and people assume that auto loans and credit cards and student loans would be affected similarly. But that's not necessarily the case. As far as finding uh, a lender, uh, we list them on uh, savingforcollege.com. Uh, we have both uh, new originations and refinance on the website. Um, and we're in the process, we'll be releasing very soon, uh, a rating system, a completely objective way of rating the quality of uh, a loan uh, based on its cost, its availability, its flexibility, and its customer service. So uh, look for that within about a month. We'll have that out. Um, most private student loans for new borrowing occur during the summer months, June, July, and August. Uh, so that's when you're going to start seeing more marketing by these private student loan lenders trying to attract your attention. Awesome. Uh, going back to grad school here. So we have someone who asked, daughter in grad school, considering taking a new loan while rates are low, then repay when market recovers and 529 isn't down as much. Want to conserve available cash now since the job security situation is iffy. Does this make sense? Right. Well, first of all, if you're still working, you haven't lost your job, there are 22 million Americans who have lost their jobs, um, make sure you have an emergency fund with at least half a year's salary. That way, if you lose your job in the future, you're going to have enough money to live off of. Um, with regard to the private student loans um, or federal loans, borrowing them now instead of using 529 plan money, um, 529 plans uh, are now able to repay up to $10,000 in student loans as a qualified expense. Uh, it's a lifetime limit for the borrower, um, and it can be used for either the beneficiary or the beneficiary's siblings, or you could always change the beneficiary on the 529 plan to maybe the parent, and then take the distribution to repay the parent loans. Um, so you do have that option, uh, so that might uh, provide you with some flexibility to borrow now while the stock market is down and after the stock market recovers, uh, use the 529 plan money to repay the student loans. Or you, you might just keep those student loans um, because it's a historically low interest rate. Uh, you might never get interest rates this low ever again, um, so back in 2005, uh, when federal student loans hit historically low interest rates, people have tried to preserve those interest rates by using the longest possible repayment term because 2.8% I mean, at the time was I mean, the lowest possible interest rate ever. Well, now we're going to beat that um, we're for new loans starting July 1st. Sounds good. Um, a lo another strategy question here. So we had somebody who asked, wouldn't it be better for parents to not claim the college student on their tax return, 
not get the $500 and ergo let the student get the $1,200 check. Okay, so the recovery rebate is based on whether the student is claimable, not whether they are claimed. So voluntarily not claiming the student as a dependent on your federal income tax return doesn't make that student eligible for it. Um, so unfortunately, if the student's under age 24, they're not eligible for the recovery rebate regardless of whether you claim them or not. Uh, and the parents are not eligible for the $500 per qualifying child if that college student is age 17 or older. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, another question, can a self-employed individual take advantage of the $5,250 pre-tax employer paid student loan payment on behalf of the employee? If so, effectively the self-employed individual pays $5,250 off of their student loan using pre-tax dollars. Potentially, yes. Um, you have to be, um, if you're self-employed, you have to have it as a formally recognized business. So you would have to be using Schedule C um, or, and you could be uh, an S corporation or a partnership, um, but you would have to uh, set it up um, so that uh, it, it's not just I mean, ad hoc. Uh, also, there are rules against um, providing this to highly compensated employees. Uh, so I mean, even if you're the only employee, you still have to follow those rules but it is something worth investigating. Gotcha. Um, we have another person asking about uh, employer related stuff. They say, does the tax credit for employer contributions to student loans apply to just federally owned loans or do private loans get the same benefit this year? Repeat the question. Sure. Does the tax credit for employer contributions to student loans apply to just federally owned loans or do private loans get the same benefit this year? Um, it's not restricted. Um, it's, uh, it can apply to any uh, qualified education loan, which includes all federal loans. It also includes most private student loans. Gotcha. Um, on to forgiveness questions. So someone asked, for those of us on public health loan forgiveness, if our monthly payments are on hold as stated by Fed loans, then are we still getting credit each month to count toward our forgiveness? Yes. Um, so public service loan forgiveness counts these non-payment payments as though there were payments. Um, so you'll get uh, as many as six months worth of payments. So instead of having to make 120 qualifying payments, you only have to make 114. However, under the current rules, you have to still be working in that public service job. Um, you don't have to make the loan payments, but you still have to otherwise have been eligible for that uh, payment to count. Um, so if you lost your job I and mean, you are getting the payment suspended, but uh, it isn't counting towards the loan forgiveness. Uh, some members of Congress want to change that. Uh, remains to be seen whether a supplemental bill is going to make changes to that and um, the uh, recovery rebate. Uh, there's a proposal that people who graduate this year might have a three-year deferment on repaying their student loans, but those are just proposals at this point. Gotcha. Oh, and with regard to the previous question, the way to tell if you have a qualified education loan is if you are able to claim the student loan interest deduction on it, that is the very definition of a qualified education loan. Got it. Um, and Mark, we've had a few questions about some people seeking relief options, um, not to go into too many details there, but essentially um, a lot of these people are asking, they have high interest rates on their private and federal loans. Um, the schools aren't budging and aren't helping them out with that. Um, how would you recommend they, they go about this? So, I mean, we've talked about the CARES Act and the relief there. Are there any other relief options out there for people who are struggling with student loans right now? Well, we, we pretty much covered them. I mean, they should look into the deferments and forbearances, alternate repayment plans, such as income-driven repayment plans or extended repayment plans. Some of the private lenders have a kind of graduated uh, repayment plan, which starts off with lower payments. They also have forbearances and partial forbearances. What I suggest you do is call the loan servicer, explain your situation, ask what options they have for financial relief, and they will tell you based on your circumstances on a case-by-case -case basis what they're gonna offer you. 
it's a good idea before you call them to check out the lender's website and see what they have listed on their website as the options they can provide, whether it's a forbearance or an interest rate reduction or a payment reduction. Uh, check out their website, then call. So you know what they normally offer. And if they don't offer it to you, you can then say, well, what about uh, this thing I read on your website? Uh, and unfortunately, you, you can't really negotiate um, a change in the interest rate. I mean, federal loans don't change the interest rates. Um, it's set by law. But uh, you can get these built-in options like deferments and forbearances uh, and the income-driven repayment plans. Great. Um, and a related question. We have a student who uh, has Navient Services um, that's servicing their student loan. They're asking, um, they're trying to make a payment. Um, Navient Services is telling them that not to worry about that issue because of CARES. Um, do you agree that they should just wait until the situation with the coronavirus is over? Should they try to fix this payment issue, um, applying payments to interest through their website? Well, the, if the loan has been suspended, there should be no interest. The interest should be sus set to zero until September 30th. Um, but what if you have the ability to continue making payments? Should you? Well, um, first thing though is check whether you have sufficient emergency fund so that if you lose your job, you'll have money to survive off of. Then you could consider making an extra payment or a set of extra payments on your student loans, maybe the amount that you would have been paying otherwise before the payment pause. You can do that. Most of the lenders will have a tool on their website that you can just use a transfer from your bank account, one-time transfer to transfer the money to the lender. If you were set up for auto pay, all that's been suspended, but you can still make a one-time payment or send them a check to um, have that applied to your loan balance. And it will be applied to the principal balance only because there's no interest accruing. Uh, you may want to apply it to the loan with the highest interest rate because that will save you the most money on interest when they interest rates uh, revert to their old interest rates. Um, and that might be not a federal loan, it might be a private loan. So you don't necessarily have to make the payments to Naviant uh, for a federal loan if you also have private loans that charge a higher interest rate. Or it, it doesn't even need to be uh, an educational loan. Maybe your highest interest rate is on your credit cards, which may not have been paused. Well, and if you've been carrying a balance uh, from month to month, which you shouldn't be doing, but if you have, make that extra payment on that credit card debt because a typical interest rate on credit cards is around 12, 14%, except for these temporary uh, um, short-term uh, interest waivers that they sometimes have uh, as an incentive to sign up for a credit card. Great, um, ch changing gears here a little bit to the FAFSA, we had someone ask, what if there's a FAFSA aid application for a particular fiscal year pending decision and due date for tuition payment that has elapsed. Since there has been a previously approved federal loan, would that be factored into, um, into it or does it have to be applied for every year over and over again? That you have to submit the FAFSA every year. Um, it lasts only for one year. So on October 1st of this year, you will be filing the FAFSA for the 2021-22 academic year. Um, but the FAFSA uses the prior prior year income and taxes as a basis for its determination of your ability to pay, the calculation of the expected family contribution, or EFC. So someone who is filing this fall for the 2021-22 academic year, that's going to be based on 2019 income, which obviously doesn't reflect your current ability to pay for college. So you would appeal to the college to say, well, I lost my job, or my salary got cut, or I've been furloughed, um, that two-year-old information is no longer reflective of my ability to pay, then the college will evaluate it and potentially make an adjustment to your FAFSA's uh, income and tax information. Uh, sometimes they'll do an estimate of the upcoming year's income. Uh, sometimes they'll uh, and do something else, but they're going to want to look at, well, are you receiving unemployment and for how long and, or did you get a new job and is that at lower pay? And they'll take that, try to do a holistic review to take everything into account. Now, 
there's only a few months left in the current academic year, the 2019-20 academic year, um, and uh, and also uh, upcoming is the 2020-21 academic year, which you filed the FAFSA for and potentially as early as October of last year. Um, obviously, those are based on older information that doesn't reflect the current unusual circumstance. My advice is appeal. Because if your income has changed, your ability to pay has changed, even with only two months left in the current academic year, it is stir still worth appealing. You might get some additional financial aid. Great. Um, back to employers here. We had a user ask, are there tax benefits for employers who sign up for LA, um, LRAPs? Any benefits besides just employee retention? Well, I, the reason why employers provide LRAPs, um, student loan repayment assistance programs, is because it is a really good recruiting and retention tool. But there are some states that provide a tax credit to the employer for providing student loan repayment assistance. Uh, there also, um, the employer can exclude it from their taxable income because it's, it's an expense for them and so it reduces the employer's income so they don't have to pay taxes on it. So there are some benefits to employers for doing this, but the state benefits obviously vary from state to state. Gotcha. Um, and going back to 529s, uh, what if I received a refund from my son's college, but instead of contributing it back to the 529 plan, I just use it toward next semester's tuition, room, and board? Is that reasonable? Well, 529 plan distributions to be qualified have to be made in the same tax year as the qualified expenses. So if you receive a refund of room and board now for the spring semester, and you're just going to use that money in the fall, um, that's, and your tax year ends on December 31st, then it's all within the same tax year, no problem. But if you're on a fiscal year basis that ends in June, well, then um, you have to either recontribute that money within that same tax year or use it for, um, have other qualified expenses that can justify it within that tax year. Got it. We have another question. Our kids are still in college, but we have both student loans and parent plus loans and are not officially in the repayment period. What should we do or can we do to benefit from the new benefits? Okay, so if these are federal loans that are held by the federal government, uh, you don't need to do anything. It's going to be automatic. Uh, even though you might not be in repayment yet, it's still going to have the interest waived. And once you would normally have ended, uh, entered into repayment, uh, the, um, if it's before September 30th, you're going to have that payment pause in effect. Um, and uh, we reviewed earlier on some options for uh, private loans, um, such as forbearances and, um, and qualified uh, and um, uh, interest-only payments, uh, what's called a partial forbearance. Those are uh, options you should explore. Got it. Uh, we have someone else asking if uh, they're on a fixed interest rate loan on a private loan, will that fixed rate be adjusted now that rates are lower? No, uh, fixed rate is fixed for the life of the loan. However, you're on a private loan, there are no prepayment penalties on private student loans. So if your credit's good, nothing stops you from refinancing that loan to get a new private student loan at a lower fixed rate. Uh, obviously, given that we're at historically low interest rates, I'd recommend that the refinance be at a fixed rate as opposed to a variable rate, because interest rates have nowhere to go but up. Um, but uh, I, that is worth considering. But the, the lenders aren't going to change an existing interest rate that is fixed uh, unless you refinance. Got it. Uh, we have somebody but, else. You could, you could always try calling up your lender and saying, I'm thinking about refinancing with another lender. Will you adjust the interest rate on my loan? Sometimes they'll do something. Some, most of the time they won't, especially if the loan has already been securitized. It's technically they don't have the ability to uh, compromise on the interest rate. If it's still held on their books, they might be able to do that to prevent you from 
switching to another lender, especially if your credit scores have improved uh, or and something that sometimes helps is if you promise to repay the student loan using auto pay. Uh, sometimes the, they like having that automatic stream cash flow coming in as opposed to sometimes people uh, miss payments. They're less likely to do so if they're on auto debit. So that's something to, to offer them to see if they'll, maybe they'll negotiate. Most of the time they won't, but I mean, who knows, maybe you'll get lucky. Awesome. Um, another question here. Uh, do you see um, it realistic that further loan forgiveness be passed, especially for healthcare workers like resident doctors with large medical school loans? Well, doctors are, and nurses are doing an incredible job. Uh, and so there are calls for them to get some sort of relief. Uh, some of those calls are for forgiving their loans. Um, though there are some doctors who paid off their loans long ago, so it might be better to just give them a bonus. Uh, also, doctors who maybe they were not working in emergency medicine or respiratory therapy, but in a, some other field, and they rose to the call and are starting to I mean, help out, um, well, they get paid based on the number of patients they see a day. So it might be a few dozen a day. Well, now that they're dealing with coronavirus patients, um, they may be seeing only 12 patients a day because I mean, someone who's intubated um, is uh, a lot more intensive, requires a lot more work. And so they're getting paid less. And they're putting themselves at risk and getting paid less. They deserve to have some, uh, a bonus of some kind or maybe forgive their student loans. Got it. Um, another question here about 529s. Uh, someone asked, um, if the 529 prepaid account is with parents who are divorced, how does that work if the non-custodial parent has the 529 and the child receives the funds? Okay. So when a 529 plan is owned by a non-custodial parent, it's just like it's owned by a grandparent, aunt, or uncle. If a 529 plan is owned by the student or the parent, it is reported as a parent asset on the FAFSA and distributions are ignored. Parent assets are assessed at a bracketed scale up to maximum 5.64%. If it's owned by a grandparent, non-custodial parent, aunt or uncle, or anybody other than the parent or child, it's not reported as an asset on the FAFSA, but distributions count as untaxed income to the beneficiary, to the student. Untaxed income to the student can be assessed at a rate that is as much as half of the distribution amount, reducing aid eligibility. Now, because the FAFSA is on a prior, prior year basis, it's looking at two-year-old information, if the student's going to graduate in four years, then any income after January, on or after January 1st of the sophomore year in college will not affect their FAFSA for that undergraduate education. I mean, it might affect their graduate education if they go immediately into grad school. Now, if they require five years, then it's January 1st of the junior year in college. So one strategy would be to wait until after um, the January 1st of the sophomore year in college to take the distribution to pay expenses. And during the first year and a half, you have to find some other method, maybe loans, to pay for those college costs. Uh, so, and that is a workaround. Another workaround would be to roll over um, a year's worth of costs from the grandparent-owned or non-custodial parent-owned 529 plan to a parent-owned 529 plan. Uh, if you do this after the FAFSA is filed, it won't be reported as an asset on the FAFSA. And because the distribution will come from a parent-owned 529 plan, it won't get reported as uh, income to the beneficiary on a subsequent FAFSA. Uh, so that's kind of giving you the best of both worlds. There are other options, like you might be able to change the account owner from the non-custodial parent to the custodial to the parent uh, who fills out the FAFSA, uh, or roll it over to another 529 plan in the, in, with the child as beneficiary. Or you could always do it as a uh, custodial 529 plan account where the child is both account owner and beneficiary, since the child is not yet at the age of majority, I mean, depending on state, it's 18, 19, or 21, 
Uh, they need a custodian to manage it, and that could be the non-custodial parent, but it will still be reported as a parent asset on the FAFSA. So there are a lot of possibilities. We have an article on savingforcollege.com that talks about workarounds for grandparent-owned 529 plans. Just replace grandparent with non-custodial parent. It's the same exact advice. Got it. Um, we have another person asking about employer-related things. They say, does the employee have to have been both the borrower and the individual who used the loan for higher education in order for an employer to offer payment assistance tax-free? It depends on the employer. There's nothing in the law that um, requires the, um, the employee to be both the borrower and the student. Um, so you could be a parent who borrowed for a child or even a grandparent who borrowed for a grandchild. Um, there, and you can get that benefit. Most of the time, these uh, benefits are being provided to recent college graduates. Uh, some employers have explicit restrictions, like you have to be a certain number of years from college graduation. Um, but others are uh, starting to think about, um, out of a sense of fairness, uh, what are they gonna do for um, their older employees? Now the 5250 is because this is um, was an amendment to a part of the tax code that relates to employer paid tuition assistance. So they simp it's uh, the law is actually educational assistance, which was originally defined as just paying tuition and related expenses, and they just added in student loan repayment as an additional type of educational expense. There are proposals out there to make 529 plan contributions. Um, uh, also eligible for this, and the employers could say, I mean, you're going to get $1,200 worth of benefits, because they don't have to give the 5250, they can give less and most do less, and you choose whether it's going to be tuition repayment, uh, uh, loan repayment, tuition, or if a uh, law changes, uh, uh, 529 plan contributions. And there's a company called Gradvisor that is related to saving for college, that uh, helps facilitate employer contributions to employee 529 plans. Great, um, related question that just came in. Can a 529 plans contributor and beneficiary be the same person? Uh, yes. Great, um, another question. With the six month CARES Act forbearance, forbearance should the same pay, P-A-Y-E, payment plan payments be directed toward highest interest loans? And will it be applied first to any interest accrued before March 13th, 2020? Right. So if you're in an income driven repayment plan or public service loan forgiveness, uh, the question you might have is, should I make extra payments if I can? The answer to that is probably no, because if you're pursuing public service loan forgiveness and your payments are paused and they count as payments towards public service loan forgiveness, you don't get any benefit from making extra payments on the loans. In fact, you're going to reduce the amount of forgiveness that you're going to receive in the end. So from that perspective, I mean, if you're pursuing loan forgiveness, you shouldn't make extra payments. Now with the income driven repayment plans, of which pay is one of them, um, there is 20 or 25 year forgiveness at the end of the repayment term of any remaining balance owed. But some people may actually pay off their debt under an income driven repayment plan before reaching that forgiveness point. So from that perspective, if you are, I mean, if your income, annual income exceeds the total amount you originally owed, then you might actually um, already be um, not going to reach that forgiveness point, in which case making an extra payment just helps you by reducing the interest that you're charged. Um, another question for new loans for next fall, will there still be a subsidized versus subsidized option? Um, nothing in the law has changed. The um, Higher Education Act, which is a piece of federal legislation that controls all federal student aid programs, um, well, except for military student aid, uh, it gets reauthorized every so many years. It's supposed to be every four or five years. Uh, the last reauthorization occurred 11 years ago. So we're overdue for a reauthorization. 
Senator Alexander, who is chairman of the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, once to get reauthorization due this year. Uh, he and the ranking member, Senator Murray, were pretty close to an agreement. Um, so it may still happen this year. Uh, and one of the proposals, and I don't know whether this is in the legislation, would be to get rid of the subsidized student loans, replacing them entirely with unsubsidized loans, and then use that savings for increased grants. Um, that's a proposal that's come up past several reauthorizations as well. It's never been enacted, but it could occur. But if reauthorization doesn't occur, there will still be subsidized and unsubsidized loans this fall. Uh, great. Um, so, Mark, just kind of checking the time here. We still have a lot of questions um, on the queue. Is five more minutes okay with you? Sure. Okay, um, cool. So we're going to try to answer as many as possible. If you guys do have more questions, please do keep sending them on. Um, we actually have two ideas for how to address that. We'll either address you guys via email or actually make an article where we answer all of these questions in detail in written form. And of course, we'll share that with everybody who has been able to sign on. Um, so here, going on to a question that actually just came in, seems interesting. If an employer's contribution to student loans is a tax deductible business expense for the employer, is the same the case for 529 plan contributions by the employer? Potentially. I and mean, remember, this is not yet something that's authorized in law. Um, obviously, it is an expense for the employer, and so potentially would reduce their EBITDA, but um, this is something that you'll need to have an accountant who is familiar with your particular circumstances review um, and make a determination. Um, and what it would probably, under current law, the way it probably works is yes, the employer gets to deduct it from their income, and, but it then becomes taxable income to the employee. Got it. Um, and we had a general question come early on. Someone asked, um, what are the COVID-19 implications for making choices between federal versus private loans? Um, Well, I'm not sure how to answer that. Um, I know federal loans have the payment pause and interest waiver, which is something that private loans don't offer. I mean, they may have a special forbearance of a few months uh, that you can qualify for, but the interest isn't necessarily going to be waived. Uh, some lenders for people in extreme hardship may have an interest rate reduction or other um, provisions for private loans. Uh, but generally speaking, federal loans are cheaper, more available, and have better repayment terms than private student loans. When it comes to federal parent loans versus private parent loans, uh, if you have excellent credit, you might actually be able to get a lower interest rate and no fees on a private loan, whereas the federal loans right now, uh, Parent PLUS loan is 7.079% with fees of 4.236%, um, and the fees of about 4% are the equivalent of a 1% increase in the interest rate. So your interest rate to compare for the federal loans would be around 8%. So if you can get a lower interest rate on a private loan, uh, it might be financially worthwhile, but you do lose the superior benefits of the federal loans, which have a certain value. So you need to evaluate the trade-off between the two. Got it. Um, we have another specific question here. Someone asked, the Association of State Treasurers said many people are eligible to deposit refunds to the 529 plan after 60 days without penalty or consequence. It's part of the IRS guidelines on extension of deadlines that was published. Uh, can you touch on this? Is this the case? Right. And it's, I, I mentioned it during the talk. You have 60 days uh, in order to uh, recontribute the refund from the date it is received um, into the 529 plan to avoid um, having to pay taxes and the 10% tax penalty and possible recapture of state income tax breaks that are attributable to the refund the amount uh, to avoid those and um, just be as though it is part of the uh, 529 plan. Um, otherwise, if you wait more than 60 days, it'll be treated as a new contribution and the amount that was refunded will be subject to 
the income taxes and tax penalty. Um, the when the money is recontributed to a 529 plan, it is treated as entirely contributions. It is not because uh, they have no practical way of determining how much of that refund was from earnings and how much was from principal contributions to the 529 plan. So the IRS hasn't formally issued guidance, but what they've said is that they would treat that as um, if it was entirely principal. It has to be recontributed to a 529 plan for the same beneficiary. You can't do it to a sibling or to someone else. So after you've recontributed it, you can always um, change the beneficiary on the 529 plan. Um, but notice I said a 529 plan, not the 529 plan. So you could do, do the recontribution to a different 529 plan that lists the same beneficiary. Uh, and that may give you some flexibility if you have 529 plans in multiple states because you moved around a lot. You may have one of these um, 529 plans that you want to, uh, you prefer over the others. Great. Um, actually, we have a quick follow up on that 60 day um, refund point you made. Mark, the question is the question on the 60 day refund to 529. The IRS said you have longer than 60 days as part of tax deadline extension, extensions without penalties. Shall I send this announcement over to send to participants? It is important as so many people receive funds past the 60 day deadline. Okay, well, they weren't specific on how much longer you have. So 60 days, I mean, if you can stick with it, is best. Um, if it takes you longer for some reason, I mean, you try it and see what uh, the IRS ultimately says. I mean, I don't think the IRS has any real practical way of knowing that this occurred. Um, the uh, The reporting from the, the 1099Q and the other reporting from uh, the uh, 529 plans don't necessarily have a specific field for recontributions. So um, it, uh, it may not, and they, maybe they put in a note or something, but I, mean, I doubt the IRS is going to penalize people um, because of the coronavirus. Gotcha, gotcha. And the final question, someone asked, would now be a good time to consolidate federal loans to a private lender for a low fixed rate? Well, and it depends on your particular circumstances. What is the interest rate that you currently have on the federal loans? What is the interest rate that you will get from the private loan? And um, is that interest rate, and though it should be fixed, is that interest new interest rate going to be lower than the interest rate that you're paying on the federal loan? Um, and it probably should be substantially lower in order to make it financially worthwhile. So if you have a parent plus loan from several years ago when interest rates on plus loans were eight and a half percent, um, you can probably get a much lower interest rate on a private student loan. The only word of caution that I really have besides the loss of the benefits on the federal loans, which aren't as great for parent loans as they are for student loans is, um, with regard to refinancing into a home equity loan or line of credit. Uh, remember, some home equity loans are variable rate. Uh, you want a fixed rate. Uh, also, a home equity loan is like a mortgage. If you default on a home equity loan, they can repossess, they can foreclose on your home. If you default on a student loan, they can't repossess your education. So some people might wish that could occur. So and you need to be careful, especially in times of economic turbulence, because who knows, maybe you lose your job and then you suddenly aren't able to make your mortgage payments. That could put your house in jeopardy. And, um, and obviously you, you don't want to uh, do a student loan that makes it harder for you uh, to repay your mortgage. Also, home equity loans no longer have um, a uh, interest deduction on your tax returns, whereas student loans still have that student loan interest deduction of um, that's an above the line exclusion from income for up to $2,500 of interest paid on federal and certain private student loans. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Mark. Um, if our panelists could speak or if our attendees could speak, I'm sure they would uh, thank you a lot too. 
Um, very thorough information for all of um, you panelists out there who maybe didn't get your questions answered. Like we said, we're gonna send out an email uh, recording of uh, this presentation and we also hope to answer your questions in future articles, um, content that you can find on savingforcollege.com. We're adding a lot of new content relating to student loans, the coronavirus, and this is the first of many webinars to come given how popular this one was. Um, so thank you everybody for attending and Mark, I don't know if you have any final closing thoughts. Oh, I'm, I'm glad to um, provide help and uh, we welcome your ideas on if you have questions that you need answered about planning, saving and paying for college, please reach out to us and we get some of our best story ideas from our readers.